Attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar on ocular applications at the point of care, presented by Dr. Appa Sohoni. At the end of this webinar, participants should feel comfortable using ultrasound to identify normal eye anatomy, to evaluate posterior chamber pathology, and to measure the optic nerve sheath diameter. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM, and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Dr. Sahoni has no disclosures. AIUM staff members and individuals involved with planning this activity have no disclosures. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenter, you may submit them by typing them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenter will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time she will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM website. And now we're pleased to present Dr. Abba Sohoni. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. My name is Appa Sahoni. I did my residency at Highland Hospital in Oakland. I also did a fellowship there, and I've been uh, on faculty there since that time. I've had a very good experience with ultrasound there, being trained by Arun Nagdev, who is my fellowship director. And I have prepared this talk with the help of Jen Carnell, who's the ultrasound director at Benta Hospital in Texas, so I would just like to acknowledge them at the start of this presentation. Please make note of any questions you have and please submit them. I will try to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. These are the objectives of the next hour. My hope is that you will learn the mechanics of how to perform an ocular ultrasound exam, that you will be able to apply bedside ocular ultrasound to patients who have suffered trauma, and that then you'll also go beyond that and, ultras and understand ultrasound appearance of just significant ocular pathology such as retinal detachment, vitreous detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, things that we worry about a lot in the emergency department and are uh, constantly on the lookout for. We'll spend some time talking about the relatively newer applications of ocular ultrasound, specifically optic nerve sheath diameter as well as papilledema, and then we'll look at some cases. I hope that at the end of this hour, you'll feel that your ultrasound machine is actually a necessary tool uh, to have in your uh, clinical practice, whether it's your primary care clinic, emergency department, to help you evaluate the eye. Most of you are probably very comfortable with uh, using your ophthalmoscope. I think that this is a skill that uh, all of us were taught in med school but you know, when you have a patient like this who's kind of calm and cooperative and you're comfortable being that close to them, it's very you know, ideal to use your direct ophthalmoscope. But unfortunately, in the emergency department at least, a lot of our patients are not that calm and cooperative or their eyes just do not lend themselves very well to uh, sitting in a chair and being examined. You might see somebody with this sort of traumatic hyphema, which obscures use of the direct ophthalmoscope. Or you may see a patient with cataracts where you just can't see very much in the posterior chamber. 
So when you look at ultrasound versus the ophthalmoscope for evaluation of the eye, what you'll find is that in settings of periorbital trauma, vitreous pathology such as hemorrhage, detachment, foreign body, cataracts, or hyphema, ultrasound actually performs far superior to use of the direct ophthalmoscope. So let's move ahead now and really get into how to perform an ocular ultrasound at the bedside. You're going to use your linear transducer. You're going to scan in both sagittal and transverse planes. I recommend that you use a lot of cold gel and a tegaderm to cover the patient's eye. This is a kinetic exam or an exam that uses motion where you're going to ask the patient to move their eye and look from side to side as well as up and down. This is always with their eye closed underneath the gel, underneath the tegaderm. And then you're going to examine their eye at both high and low gain. I'm hoping that most of you are comfortable with what gain means, but for those of you who aren't, I'll just explain it now, where low gain is where you don't have a lot of brightness on your ultrasound screen, and high gain is when you have a lot of brightness. So this is the probe that you're going to be using. It's your high-frequency linear transducer. This is uh, an image showing you the sagittal plane right here, as well as the transverse plane. And if you notice in this picture, the ultrasonographer is doing a good job of bracing their pinky on the patient's nose, and they're very lightly touching the probe to the patient's eye. By bracing your pinky on the patient's nose, that's how you maintain good control of the ultrasound transducer and avoid putting too much pressure on the eye. There's always the concern from both ophthalmology as well as uh, ER practitioners of when we do bedside ultrasound of the eye, could we possibly be raising the intraocular pressure and do damage to the eye? Now, luckily, um, if you brace your hand well, you can really do this exam with a very light touch. In general, loss of the vitreous is what everyone is afraid of. Vitreous is the only substance that ophthalmologists cannot replace into an eye. So if you use a lot of gel, especially cold gel that maintains its form, and apply a tegaderm, brace your hand on the patient's nose, um, and then put light pressure, you should be okay, and you should not run the risk of extruding any vitreous. This is in the transverse plane showing how high up on the patient's eye you start the exam. Again, note that the fingers are braced on the patient's face. And then you just kind of fan down. And that's the complete exam. And you'll do the same thing with the probe indicator pointing towards the patient's forehead in a side-to-side -side fashion. This is showing how we like to do the tegaderm with the gel. So you have the tegaderm that you put directly onto the patient's eye with their eye closed, and then you just layer a ton of gel on top. And what's nice about that is that at the end, when you go to take off the tegaderm, the patient's eye is nice and dry. They are very comfortable. Patients have very high satisfaction when you do this. So let's look at what a normal eye looks like. This is in the transverse orientation, again, using the linear probe. And this is a normal eye. The eye is ideal for ultrasound, mainly because it is a fluid-filled structure, and ultrasound loves fluid. So here you have the footprint of the probe, which is the linear transducer. This is the patient's skin, and all of it, this down here is we're moving deeper into the patient's body. So what you can appreciate here is the anterior portion of their eye and this is the posterior chamber. This is back here is the retina, and what will come into view is the optic nerve right there, this hypoechoic area. Let me show you the sonographic anatomy a little bit better on this slide. So again, the ultrasound probe is sitting on the patient's eyelid, closed eyelid, looking down. And what you're first gonna see is the cornea up here. This is the pupil. Here's the lens. This is the vitreous. Here's the retina, and the optic nerve goes off behind. This is at higher gain. If you look back at this image, you can appreciate how dark the screen is overall. This is a low gain image. When you dial up that gain, everything looks more bright white. And what's nice about that is that 
certain structures that are white will show up brighter against the black background. So in this case, the, the lens is seen very well. A nice thing you can do with ultrasound is evaluate extraocular movements. We'll get to this in the case of trauma. But what you do is when the patient's eye is closed, again, underneath the tegaderm, under the gel, you just say, look to your right, look to your left, look up, and look down. And what you should see is some nice, smooth movement. And what you're looking for is, in this posterior chamber, you're looking to see if there's any hemorrhage, detachment, things like that. So these are all examples of normal eyes. So now let's move on to the abnormals, which is what everyone's interested in. Let's first talk about ocular ultrasound in trauma patients. Here are the things that you can use ocular ultrasound for that are in a patient who suffered trauma. You can look at if their pupil is reactive. You can look at if they can move their eye. Are their extraocular movements intact? Is there a globe rupture? Is there a foreign body in the eye? Is there a lens dislocation? Or is there a retrobulbar hematoma? This is a very important caveat, which is that our bedside ultrasound of the eye, point of care ultrasound study that is trying to answer a discrete question, we're trying to rule in pathology. We're not trying to rule out pathology. So these bedside studies that we do should not um, preclude you consulting ophthalmology. What I use my bedside ultrasound for is to better inform my consult when I call the ophthalmologist and also to help me triage with what urgency I think my patient needs to be seen. Does this patient need to be seen tomorrow, right then in the emergency department, or can they wait a week or so for follow-up? So this is the first patient. This is a paper that was published out of Highland uh, in 2010 looking at what we can do with this patient who we all see so commonly in the ER, which is a patient who's been a victim of trauma and comes in with their eyes swollen shut because there's so much periorbital swelling and ecchymosis. And what you want to know is what's going on with the eye that's underneath those swollen eyelids. So the first thing you can do on them and have them move their eye side to side and make sure that their extraocular movements are intact and that there is, in fact, no entrapment. This is a much easier way to do this uh, than the old-fashioned paperclip technique of prying open that patient's eyelids. Secondly, maybe you just need to know about their pupil. Well, what's really nice about ultrasound is that you can do that as well. You put the probe on the patient's eye. You can tell this is an old image because we weren't doing the tegaderm yet. We were just putting gel directly on the patient's eye. And, but what you can do is by putting the probe uh, you know, right underneath the eyebrow, looking down at the eye, you'll get a nice view of the pupil with the iris, and then there's, a, there's the upper eyelid. And what you can do is test both the consensual and the direct light reflex by just shining a light. And I hope you can all appreciate right here, let's stay focused on that pupil. They're shining light and the pupil is reacting. I can promise you that this is so much more comfortable for your patient who's been a victim of trauma rather than you with a paper clip prying their eye open and then shining a light in it. Here's another example of nice pupillary light reactivity. So you just, there you go. You see that nice constriction in the pupil. And again, you can check direct light reflex by just shining light onto the swollen lid. Uh, there's normally enough light that gets through to make that pupil react. And then you can check the consensual light reflex by shining light on the opposite eye. You can also, if you're interested, as they were doing just a second ago in this clip, measure the actual width of the pupil <laughs> if you're interested in that. A very nice trick. So now, this is a normal eye. Let's remember what it looks like. It's a hypoechoic structure, which is lined on the back by a normal thin that's very flush with the back of the eye. You couldn't distinguish the retina from the back of the eye on this image, because this is a normal eye. And now let's look at this uh, patient's eye. This was an unfortunate case of a young adult, a 15-year-old, where they had been playing with fireworks and uh, as you can tell here, came in with a lot of trauma to the eye. The eyelid was very swollen, and this is their eye. And what we're looking at here is this is what globe rupture looks like. You see some uh, foreign bodies versus air. You see that this entire hypoechoic globe is now filled with uh, what, what blood is, basically, and this is rupture of the globe. 
Again, here's your nice normal eye, and this is globe rupture. Whether you've done ocular ultrasound or not, I'm hoping that by the end of this lecture, the abnormals will, will really stand out to you. So again, this is a normal eye, and this is an eye where there's a foreign body in it. So foreign bodies uh, will appear normally as bright white, obviously based on what it is, but most of the time it's metal or something sharp that has penetrated into the eye. And that metal will show up as a bright white spot, and there'll be this reverberation artifact behind it as the ultrasound beams do not fully transmit past it. So again, here's a normal eye. And this down here, all of a sudden you ultrasound this person's eye and you see a bright white line all the way at the bottom and you think, that shouldn't be there because in my normal eye there's nothing back there. It's just a hypoechoic chamber. So what could this be? And you would realize something's missing from up here, something that was up there in my normal eye. And what you realize is that that is what a lens dislocation looks like. The dislocated lens is now free-floating in the vitreous. <clears throat> this is probably one of the most useful uh, applications of bedside ocular ultrasound, and that is looking at not even in the eye, but what's behind the eye. This hypoechoic area is a retrobulbar hematoma or retrobulbar hemorrhage. And it's this sort of injury that can actually end up causing ocular compartment syndrome, visual loss, and needs to be reversed immediately with the lateral canthotomy. So these are now the entities that I'm hoping you'll be comfortable recognizing in your clinical practice. So again, looking at the pupils, looking at extraocular movements, evaluating the globe for obvious signs of globe rupture, looking at the globe for a foreign body, looking at the position of the lens to see if it's dislocated, and then looking deep to the eye to see if there's any retrobulbar hematoma. Now let's move on to think about some of the other diseases that we all get concerned about in the patients who show up with eye complaints to the emergency department. So the patients with flashes and floaters, the patient on Coumadin who struck their head and is having some visual changes. Let's get into some of those disease entities. So retinal detachment, this is something that often occurs secondary to either trauma or it can occur spontaneously. Patients will complain of floaters, black dots, they might see flashes of light. Uh, once it has been present for a while, then they might be missing a portion of a visual field out of that eye. Uh, once the macula is involved, that's when our visual acuity really becomes severely compromised. So that's another nice thing about bedside ultrasound for retinal detachment is we can see if the macula is involved or not, and that really determines how urgently optho needs to see the patient. The macula is lateral to the optic nerve sheath, and if there's any part of the retina still attached laterally, then that is a MAC-ON detachment, and those patients need to see opto immediately to preserve their vision. So this is an example of a retinal detachment. Again, this is a low-gain study, so you do this with the gain set down low, and you're looking, instead of looking at this anterior part of the eye up here, you're really looking at the posterior part where you know the retina should be flush against the back of the eye, and instead what you see is this flap that is coming up off the back of the eye, and it's tethered here. This is another example of a retinal detachment. Again, this is this beautiful eye, but here at the back, as opposed to seeing basically nothing, you see this flap of the retina coming up. Now, this is uh, the kinetic exam that they're doing. They've asked the patient to look side to side, and they've increased the gain to see if there's any associated hemorrhage. What you're seeing here is this retinal detachment, flapping, again tethered to the back where the optic nerve enters the back of the eye, and swirling around on top of it, you're seeing all of this hemorrhage that really does look like clot that's sitting in your vitreous. So this is a retinal detachment with associated vitreous hemorrhage. It's very difficult to say if there's an associated vitreous detachment. Frankly, it doesn't really matter. At this point, your phone call to ophthalmology will say enough 
to warrant that this patient gets emergently evaluated. Now let's look at vitreous detachments. As I showed you on this image, the, when they increase the gain, that's when you really bring out the pathology in the vitreous chamber. So this is a high gain study. And the vitreous is kind of a free floating membrane that can come up off of um, the back of the eye. So vitreous detachments are also important for us to know about, mainly because vitreous detachments uh, can go hang in, hand in hand with retinal detachments, and a vitreous detachment can also lead to long-term uh, vision decrease. So it's important for us to make this diagnosis in the ER. So again, you can see how white the whole screen is. It's because the gain is up high. They're asking the patient to look side to side to really agitate the vitreous and bring out any little clots or bleeding that could be there. And you see this wavy membrane that is not tethered at all to the back of the eye. It's just free floating here. That is a vitreous detachment. A retinal detachment will always be tethered to the, some point to the back of the eye where the optic nerve comes in. A vitreous hemorrhage, which again can be secondary to either just the vitreous having detached and there's associated bleeding, or it can be because of trauma, or it can be because of any condition that causes retinal neovascularization. So, for example, poorly controlled diabetes, or if you've had a retinal vein occlusion that has now um, caused some neovascularization, those are kind of the top causes of a vitreous hemorrhage. Your vision will decrease in proportion to the amount of blood that's present in the vitreous. So sometimes you'll have a patient with you know, a huge vitreous hemorrhage who can hardly see anything, and other times you'll have a patient who can still see a lot, but they actually do have some new vitreous hemorrhage. Both patients need to see ophthalmology urgently. So again, this is it showing the, exam uh, the importance of this being a high gain. If you look at this eye on low gain, you don't see much, but as they dial up the gain, you really see all of this clot and blood that's sitting in this eye that is vitreous hemorrhage. So remember that evaluating the vitreous is a high gain study. And on this patient, it's hard to know if that's all just vitreous hemorrhage or is it vitreous detachment plus hemorrhage. There's a little thin wavy line at the bottom right there, which looks very suspicious for a vitreous detachment with associated hemorrhage. Again, this is a high gain image showing you this vitreous detachment there. This is an incredibly high gain image, almost too high gain, but it's really showing you a lot of this vitreous hemorrhage that's kind of swirling around in this person's eye. So how do we distinguish a retinal detachment and a posterior vitreous detachment? So again, the retinal detachment, you're going to see this at low gain. Uh, the posterior vitreous, you're going to see at high gain. So vitreous detachments disappear when there's low gain, and then retinal detachments are visible on low gain. Vitreous detachments really move a lot, whereas retinal detachments are wavy, but they're not free-floating throughout the vitreous. And there's always an optic disc attachment for the retinal detachment. It will always be tethered at the back of the eye, whereas a po posterior vitreous detachment might be free-floating. Sometimes you'll see all three of these pathologies together. So this is an example of a retinal detachment tethered to the back of the eye at the optic disc. This is a vitreous detachment here, and then there's hemorrhage on top of it. So again, do we really need to care about retinal detachment, or sorry, do we really need to care if there's a retinal detachment in addition to a vitreous hemorrhage or, detach, or detachment? And the answer is yes, mainly because if there is a vitreous detachment or a posterior vitreous detachment, if there's associated vitreous hemorrhage, those patients have a 62% probability of also having a retinal tear. So their likelihood ratio is 10 for having a retinal tear, which is really significant. So in terms of you triaging which patients need to see opto today, first thing in the morning, or can they wait a week, these patients should not wait. So now you have recognized how to perform a basic ocular ultrasound exam, how to apply it in patients who have suffered trauma, and I've also now shown you how to see some of the more common high-risk ocular pathologies that we worry about, retinal detachment, posterior vitreous detachment, and vitreous hemorrhage. Let's now spend some time talking about some of the newer applications of bedside ocular ultrasound.
the first one is optic nerve sheath diameter, and the second is papal edema. So using ultrasound for uh, measuring intracranial pressure has been something that people were very excited about for a long time, and it is now finally ready for mainstream. If you subscribe to Annals of Emergency Medicine, uh, in the September issue of this year, so this month's issue, they do a very nice uh, meta-analysis answering the question, can ocular ultrasound be used to assess intracranial pressure? And in their meta-analysis, they ended up having 12 studies with 478 people, kappa of 0.89. And what they found was that ultrasound is actually incredibly sensitive for distinguishing uh, elevated intracranial pressure versus normal. So in their pooled studies, their pooled sensitivity for an abnormal optic nerve sheath diameter was 95.6% sensitive and 92.3% sensitive for the diagnosis of increased intracranial pressure. And this is, uh, you know, kind of a fabulous finding that most of us who were doing this at the bedside really believed in, and it's nice to see that that's been corroborated. They only had three studies that were in children, uh, so the, the findings in children are slightly more controversial, but in adults I think it's fairly ready for mainstream. The reason why it works is because the optic nerve sheath is contiguous with your dura mater and the subarachnoid space. So when those spaces fill with more CSF uh, because of this elevation of intracranial pressure, it ends up increasing the diameter of your optic nerve sheath. So most studies, uh, the way to do it is you measure three millimeters posterior to your globe. That has been the area where that initial distension seems to happen the earliest. So the most common accepted value for abnormal is five millimeters of diameter in an adult patient, uh, four and a half millimeters for kids aged one through 17, and four millimeters for infants less than one year of age. And I have a slide that gives you those numbers. But this is how you do the measurement. You go three millimeters back, and then you measure across there. These are some of the original studies that we used to go by, which, um, you know, they all had fairly low numbers of patients, but they all showed fairly good sensitivities, right around five millimeters was when the sensitivity and the specificity really started to go up. So again, you're going to measure three millimeters posterior to the retina. Oh, and I'm sorry, this should say five millimeters, more than five millimeters in adults four and a half millimeters in kids age one through 17, and four millimeters in kids less than one year of age. So this is an example of a measurement where they went, again, three millimeters back, and then their distance across here was 0.66 centimeters or 6.6 .6 millimeters, which is definitely abnormal. This is another case where at three millimeters back, it was 3.4 millimeters across, so that was normal. And another patient where three millimeters back, it was six millimeters across, which is an, an example of increased optic nerve sheet diameter, very specific and sensitive for inter elevated intracranial pressure. Now the big caveat with this is that the angle of your probe can really change how wide the optic nerve uh, seems to look. So you need to kind of be cognizant of that. If you find yourself at a very acute angle, you kind of want to just be uh, at a neutral angle, 90 degrees to the eye, when you do this measurement. How many scans do you need to do to be able to do this accurately is a very common question. And there was a study done uh, by Tayal in 2007 where they recommended that 10 scans with three abnormal scans uh, would be sufficient to generate good levels of sensitivity and specificity for uh, measuring optic nerve sheet diameter accurately. So it's not a lot of scans, but three abnormals. It just makes me think that we should do this more and more on patients whom we are concerned about, and then our, then our you know, clinical practice will become a lot more confident, a lot easier.
next sign of elevated intracranial pressure is papilledema, which is basically when your optic disc is just being kind of raised up. And so when you look at the back of the eye, seeing this little mound here is um, showing you your optic disc being elevated. So this is, again, another sign of papilledema. This is a real study of a patient. Again, you're looking at the posterior part of the eye. Here's their optic nerve coming in. But then you already notice this papal edema. So the finding of papal edema plus the optic nerve sheath diameter being increased is very sensitive for elevated intracranial pressure. You may be wondering where, when you can use this. And there's a couple different settings. One is in a patient who uh, is, you know, you're trying to do serial neuro exams on them. This could be useful for showing you what their intracranial pressure is doing over time because this has been shown to change uh, very quickly as your intracranial pressure changes. Secondly, it could be helpful for you in, uh, in the, if you have multiple patients waiting to go to your CT scanner and you're trying to decide who needs to go. Uh, this is a very useful tool to say, you know, this patient actually looks uh, like they're having elevated intracranial pressure, let's, let's bump them up before somebody else who doesn't. All right, so, so far we've talked about how to perform an ocular ultrasound exam. We've looked at ocular ultrasound and trauma, ocular ultrasound in general for other conditions such as retinal detachment, vitreous detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, and now you also know about optic nerve sheath diameter and papal edema. So now let's go into some cases, and my hope is to spend the next 20 minutes doing uh, several cases, and after that we'll, we'll end with questions. This is a 55-year-old female who presents with very gradual vision loss in her left eye after she accidentally hit her eye against a cabinet door corner. She has a history of diabetes, hypertension, and atrial fibrillation, and she's on Coumadin. Go straight to her eye exam. In her right eye, her visual acuity is 2030, but in her left eye, her visual acuity is 2100. So you look at her eye, and you attempt direct uh, ophthalmos using your direct ophthalmoscope, and all you see is some red haziness in the back of her eye. You can't really make out her retina. So you grab your ultrasound machine and you go over. And now this is a high gain exam. You can tell that by how bright white everything is looking. It's a kinetic exam. They're doing a good job of asking the patient to look from right to left. And you're seeing this hyperechoic, dense substance just swirling in the posterior chamber of her eye. So this is vitreous hemorrhage. And this is a significant amount of vitreous hemorrhage. It's impossible for you to say if there's an associated vitreous detachment or not. That is something Otho will have to weigh in on. But you can definitely say that this is a very significant amount of vitreous hemorrhage. And in a patient on Coumadin is really an emergency. The fact that she still has 2100 visual acuity is actually impressive to me because normally, as I was saying earlier, with vitreous hemorrhage, your vision, your vision loss is proportional to the amount of blood in the vitreous. And in this case, there is so much blood in the vitreous that I'm surprised she could see anything at all. Now, the other thing is that you should all think of vitreous hemorrhage and, um, as a spectrum of disease where there's vitreous hemorrhage to posterior vitreous detachment, to retinal tear, to retinal detachment. So as the vitreous, as, they're all, as there is all of this bleeding into this vitreous chamber, the vitreous can shrink and then detach, and that can lead to this posterior vitreous detachment. Now, posterior vitreous detachment can then cause, in turn, a retinal tear, and about a third to almost half of retinal tears can go on to develop retinal detachments, which is again why these are so important for us to diagnose. So this patient, in the end, Optho was called 
her super therapeutic INR was reversed. She was given FFP and she was observed. She ended up doing fine. Next case. This is a 35-year-old male who presents with right eye pain after uh, he had a broken bottle smashed uh, against his eye. We didn't ask why. He was minding his own business. This is an eye exam again. So on his left eye, he's 20-30. On his right eye, he's unable to see anything. So when you look at his right eye, so again, this is his left eye, looks beautiful, and here's his right eye. What are the things that you notice? Hopefully you're noticing that there's just absolutely no nice, clear globe. This seems to be the globe here, mainly because of pattern recognition, and you just see this mixed, echo-dense material filling up that globe. So this is what globe rupture looks like. You can also appreciate how swollen his soft tissues are. This is all his eyelid that's swollen and comparing to the other side you can tell how abnormally thickened that is. So in the case of the globe rupture, obviously you don't want to put any pressure on the eye. You call opto emergently, administer antibiotics, and go from there. Next case. This is a 45-year-old male who presents with blurred vision out of his right eye after he was hit with an elbow in his eye while playing basketball. He's otherwise healthy, not on any blood thinners. Let's look at his eye exam. So out of his left eye, his visual acuity is 20-25, but out of his right eye, the affected eye, his visual acuity is 2100. So again, this is his left eye, which is not bothering him, and this is his right eye. And what do you notice here? Hopefully you're noticing that in his right eye, this bright white line is down below. Now, lest you think that that's some bizarre vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment, you should note that this is actually, when you compare it to the other eye, the lens that should be up here but has been dislocated to down below. Again, this is an urgent ophthalmology call for them to repair the lens. Next case, this is a 35-year-old male who shows up with right eye pain after he was punched in the eye, again, minding his own business, and you look at his eye, and his right eye, he cannot see anything. He can't even see the chart. So you go to the bedside and you find this patient, who I think we've all seen many times, with his eye completely swollen shut, significant periorbital swelling, ecchymoses. You have no idea what's going on with the eyeball that's underneath those eyelids. So you put the ultrasound probe on his eye, and immediately what you note is that whereas the globe looks okay, what's deep to the globe does not look okay. And now you're seeing this hypoechoic area deep to the globe or posterior to the globe, which is very concerning for a retrobulbar hemorrhage or a retrobulbar hematoma. Now this is one of those cases which is you know, all of our kind of worst nightmare, which is this true compartment syndrome of the eye, where if the patient has pain, ophthalmoplegia, proptosis, vision impairment, they may have an afferent pupillary defect. Um, on exam, you'll see a very tense orbit, a lot of eyelid edema, chemosis. A lot of times you can't even open their eye. Um, this hematoma normally forms because there's some bleeding from the infraorbital artery or from branches of the infraorbital artery. And the treatment for this is surgery within 60 to 120 minutes. Now, I don't know about where you are all practicing who listen to this, but oftentimes getting the patient, you know, stabilized into the scanner and getting the read from the radiologist or the Nighthawk service that you're using to read your images can take much longer than 120 minutes. 
And so what's so nice about ultrasound is that you can, at the bedside, from the doorway, put the probe on the patient, realize that this is what's going on, call your ophthalmologist, rush the patient to the scanner, um, or if, they, if you measure their uh, intraocular pressure or if you, you know, check their visual acuity, you can go ahead and proceed with canthotomy or inferior cantholysis. Indications in a comatose patient for just going ahead with a lateral canthotomy are uh, if you measure an intraocular pressure greater than 40. Um, in the meantime, you should always be treating these patients with IV acetazolamide, mannitol, IV steroids, timolol drops, um, kind of your usual stuff. But proptosis, decreased visual acuity, increased intraocular pressure, those are all uh, kind of your indications for doing a lateral canthotomy in these patients. But what's so nice about ultrasound is being able to make this diagnosis from the doorway and expedite patients to having uh, vision-saving uh, treatment. So again, this is a normal eye, and you can appreciate this posterior chamber, or the posterior, sorry, not posterior chamber, the posterior part of the eye uh, looks great, whereas here you have this large hypoechoic area, which is your retrobulbar hematoma. For the lateral canthal tendon, this is how you do your lateral canthotomy. Um, I've been told by many ophthalmologists that it just doesn't matter where you cut, just cut and release the pressure, release the eye from, its, uh, from the conditions it's under, and that they can always repair any damage that we, are, that, we, that we fear that we may cause. So be bold, do your lateral canthotomy, do your inferior cantholysis, and hopefully restore vision to this patient. So now we have, again, gone through uh, several uses of bedside ocular ultrasound. I wanted to uh, ask everybody to please try to read the annals paper from this month about using ultrasound for bedside detection of increased intracranial pressure. I also wanted to say a special note about um, pseudotumor cerebri or benign idiopathic intracranial hypertension for which optic nerve sheet diameter is actually very useful and it has been shown to be very accurate even in those patients. Um, a second sign, uh, sorry, a third sign that you can also use uh, for elevated intracranial pressure is if you look uh, at the optic nerve sheet and you look around the base of it, similar to the retrobulbar hematoma, you may, might see some fluid underneath the optic nerve sheath, which is called the crescent sign. And that's another indication of, uh, another sign of elevated intracranial pressure. So optic nerve sheath diameter, the crescent sign, as well as the papal edema. Um, I will also end by talking a little bit about pediatric patients. Pediatric patients tolerate uh, bedside ocular ultrasound very well, especially if you use warm uh, gel or if they let you put the tegaderm on and then the warm gel. This is very useful. Um, and it, whereas there were only three studies in annals meta-analysis this month, uh, when you combine optic nerve sheet diameter with looking at the optic disc for papilledema and then this crescent sign, those three findings together can really uh, are very sensitive and specific for elevated intracranial pressure, even in children. I also would just like to remind everybody that these are all um, important diseases that we can diagnose in the ER, but these do not preclude consulting ophthalmology. All of bedside ocular ultrasound should help you to make a more informed uh, more kind of cogent statement to your ophthalmologist as opposed to the usual, you know, this patient can't see, I don't know why, can you come see them at 2 in the morning. Instead now, in my experience, ophthalmologists are so grateful when we call and say, you know, I'm concerned about the posterior chamber, I've looked with ultrasound, I see vitreous hemorrhage, I don't know if there's a vitreous detachment, um, but I'm very concerned, when would you like to see this patient? That is a question that the ophthalmologists appreciate. It gives them something to work with, and I think it just builds um, our confidence in evaluating the eye while also building bridges with our consultants. So I would like to move ahead to some questions now. We have about 15, question, uh, 15 minutes now for questions.
And so I'll ask Kathy, um, I'll see, ask Kathy to show me some questions now that I can answer. Dr. Sahoni, I have sent a couple. Are you able to see them on your screen? Oh, yeah, here we go. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the first question is, I see this isn't in the objectives, but I was wondering if you can touch on the use of point-of-care ultrasound to evaluate for orbital cellulitis and differentiating it from periorbital cellulitis. It's an interesting question. Um, normally, so periorbital cellulitis is so superficial. Um, if you look on some of the images where I, where I pointed out the eyelid being swollen, that's often, you know, within one centimeter of depth of the probe. And you can, you can look at the globe itself and make sure that the globe is intact, but you won't really see that much about the globe um, if it does have orbital cellulitis. So you can more use it as confirmation that the globe looks okay, but, and you can visualize that the periorbital area is swollen. But I don't think bedside ocular ultrasound will add too much to your uh, decision point about periorbital cellulitis versus orbital cellulitis, basically because you won't see much in the actual globe, even if it is infected with cellulitis, and the superficial structures are almost too superficial um, to really assess uh, usefully. So I hope that answers that question. My question, and here's a, my question is regarding optic nerve sheath diameter. The lateral walls are often difficult to determine. There was a recent study that described the arachnoid granulations as the indistinct semi-hypoechoic area. Can you discuss landmarks or how to determine the actual lateral border? So let me go back. That's a great question. Let me go back to some of these optic nerve uh, images. I love that question because it really does touch on the fact that it's so um, challenging to when you know that your the angle that you hold your hand at can change how wide the optic nerve sheath looks. And so right now there's no consensus on how to pick that point, which is why um, the only thing everyone agrees on is to go three millimeters posterior to the eye. And then in terms of going side to side, what I try to do is basically dial my gain up or down enough to where I feel like I have this sort of an image where you can really see the edge of the optic nerve. If you can't see it, and let me show you on this one, for example, here, because should you measure from this inner border to inner border or outer border to outer border? And there's not really a good answer. I think that the arachnoid granulations is what is the newest idea, um, but I think the best bet is to actually just do several different measurements at different points and see how far off you are, and also to compare one eye to the next, meaning the patient's right eye to the left eye, and then see what the difference is. Here's another question. Have you seen echoes floating in normal individuals without vitreous or retinal detachment history. Um, I'm, I think this person must mean that do you all, can you see some, uh, I'm assuming they're meaning can you see something floating in your posterior chamber when it's not pathological? And the answer is yes. Um, at our ultrasound workshops that we do, I we all ultrasound each other, and especially for the eye, it's always interesting. Most people have some vitreous hemorrhage that's just back there in the back of their eye. Myopia is one of the risks of uh, risk factors that can lead to you having uh, vitreous hemorrhage or vit you know stuff floating in your vitreous. So for and everybody who wakes up and maybe sees cobwebs or um, you know, especially they're there present in the morning. Um, if you ultrasound those people's eyes, you will most definitely see stuff floating in their vitreous that is not pathologic at all. Um, it only becomes pathologic when they're having an increase in that amount, or they're having some sort of visual field cut, um, or they're seeing like flashes of light. Flashes of light are uh, never normal, 
Um, but just seeing, co if you're somebody who sees cobwebs and you were to go ultrasound your eye, you'd probably see a lot of stuff floating in your vitreous. That is not, a, that's not pathological. Do you use a particular technique to discriminate preceptal from intraorbital pathology? That's a good question. I mean, when we're, do, when we're uh, using bedside ultrasound, we're kind of, just the way you are clinically, we're thinking immediately, is this an anterior chamber problem or a posterior chamber problem? <clears throat> and um, if it's an anterior chamber problem, then ultrasound's probably not going to help very much. So like I was saying for periorbital cellulitis, it's too superficial. You're not going to use ultrasound to evaluate for corneal abrasion or for uveitis or iritis or anything that's kind of in the anterior chamber. It's just not going to help. What you're going to use ultrasound for is looking at the globe as a whole and is looking at everything in the posterior chamber, so the retina, the vitreous, and then the retrobulbar space. So, so, you know, so in terms of is there a particular technique to distinguish preceptal from intraorbital, um, there's nothing on ultrasound that is specific for that. It's just going to mainly be your clinical judgment combined with then kind of ruling out pathology in the posterior chamber of the eye. Next question, which I actually don't know the answer to, but I will look at this. Why, it says, why is there a change in the eye diameter at age one? Is it due to the closing of the fontanelle? Is there a different width if the fontanelle is closed or not? I think that's a fa fabulous question, and I actually don't know the answer to that at all. So I will try to look that up and, um, and send that to uh, Kathy, and maybe she can pass it along to this audience. Um, all of the studies have always cut it off at one, but again, there's only about three studies <laughs> on children specifically, so uh, not a big end there, but I will try to find out. What is the power you use to scan the eye? Not quite sure what you mean by power. If you're wondering about the transducer, it's the linear transducer which is the high frequency transducer. It's normally um, the 10 megahertz probe. You basically want to use a high frequency probe because you're trying to see uh, a very shallow structure, so you're not trying to penetrate deep into the body. But you're going to use high frequency beams at very low depth, um, and so that is always going to be your linear probe which now has a depth of you know, up to 11 centimeters, but used to max out at 6 centimeters. Regardless, you want a linear probe, which is a high-frequency, shallow-depth probe. Next question. Do you ever use a shallow field angle view to assess pupillary response in patient with periorbital sweeping, such as trauma case? Do you ever use a shallow field angle view? Um, you basically use whatever angle gets you the pupil. It's very hard in the trauma patients because they're in pain. They're not really cooperative. Their eyes, even though their eyelids are swollen shut, their eyes tend to kind of rove around or dart around. Um, sometimes they're comatose and they're not really going to follow your commands at all, in which case you're just going to take that probe and you're going to um, do just this way. I sh Let me pull it up on the screen so you can see it um, at the start of the presentation. You're going to start at the top of their eye and just move down looking for the best possible view. Um, if you have a cooperative patient, you can just say, you know, oh look, this is the perfect view, hold your eye steady right there. But otherwise, you kind of are going chasing after the eye. But I like to do it in this, this exact, smooth, kind of very systematic way until I see the pupil. What's nice also is that, you know, I showed you kind of the ideal images of looking at the pupil uh, kind of right on. But there's actually another view that you might get, which is where you end up seeing the pupil um, from the side. And you'll see the edges of the iris constrict and and dilate, and that is also totally fine. You just basically want to know if the pupil reacts or not. So you don't always have to get this perfect view of seeing the whole thing. You could see it just from the side. Uh, 
Uh, next question, do you scan optic nerve sheet diameter in transverse plane? Any other technical parameters other than low and high gain? Um, so you scan, yes, you scan the optic nerve sheet diameter in transverse. Um, and there are no other technical parameters. You just basically want to keep your depth as shallow as possible on the screen. So you're normally around three centimeters, four centimeters max. And then you're just going to do every exam at low gain and, sh and high gain. What is the advantage, next question, what is the advantage of using a tegaderm and does it hurt to remove? It doesn't hurt to remove. You just be careful when you're taking off the eyelashes that you don't pull off the eyelashes. And the advantage of it is just to, um, it's just patient comfort. Patients just don't love having a ton of gel uh, put on their eye, especially because if you have cold gel, that makes, um, that makes the, uh, that's even less comfortable for a patient to put ice cold gel on their face. Next question, what do floaters look like on ultrasound? Floaters will just look um, almost like vitreous hemorrhage, only not as um, dense, and they might be kind of scattered. So if you imagine um, just seeing like little specks uh, as opposed to like with the dense clot I showed you. Uh, where if you don't have a tegaderm, what material do you suggest is utilized? If you don't have a tegaderm, you should just put the gel on their eye and go ahead and do the study. I think we have time for one more. Also regarding tegaderm, do you get air bubbles underneath that cause interference with ultrasound? Um, it's a good question, and let me just show you. Um, let me just show you the picture of when you put on the tegaderm. You really want to put it on with um, care to kind of, you smooth it at this corner of the eye first, like around the inner uh, edge of where, where the eye meets the nasal bridge. And so you kind of really push down there first to get all of the air out. And then you smoothly kind of with your finger kind of push down as you're, as you're sticking it to the rest of the eye. And um, so you just kind of want to get it into this whole area. But it works really well. I encourage you to try it and then just put a lot of gel on top, and you should be good to go. So those were all the questions, which I'm very happy we had a chance to answer. Um, I, will, I will turn this back to Kathy, but I hope that this has been helpful and at least has gotten you interested in using ultrasound for your next eye patient. For me, it's been practice changing because um, I used to like the ophthalmoscope, but I didn't love the ophthalmoscope. And now I love doing ocular ultrasound, and I think it's made me more confident in my evaluation of the eye. So thank you so much for your time and your attention. I hope this was useful. Thank you, Kathy. And our thanks very much to you, Dr. Sahoni, for this very interesting presentation. And our thanks to all of you who participated tonight. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoy this evening's presentation, and please join us again for future webinars. Good night, everyone. Have a great evening. Good night.